Hello everyone, my name is Charles Godfrey, I'm director of the Oxford Martin School and welcome to our talk this evening. I'm delighted to say it's been given by uh, Dr. Mike Hamm. Mike is a visiting professor at the um, Oxford Martin School and is doing a lot of work on our programme on the future of food. Uh, Mike is based at Michigan State University uh, where he is the CS Mott Professor of Sustainable Agriculture. He's also a senior fellow at the Center for Regional Food Systems and he was founding director of the Center for Regional Food Systems. Uh, Mike is actually an old friend of ours. He was here for six months in 2015 and it's always nice to see Mike back. So Mike, please come up and give your talk, City Region Food Systems, Potential for Impacting Planetary Boundaries and Food Security. Thanks, Mike. Well, thank you very much. And first, I want to thank Charles and, and all the people at the Oxford Martin School for letting me come here, giving me a space to sit and allowing me to work. It's, it's always a pleasure to come. And I'm having a great time. And I, I will for the remainder of my time here. So let us get started. What I want to do today is talk about city region food systems and why I think that it's important to consider these in the context of increasing sustainability and, um, and health impacts of the food system um, in a changing world. And I'm going to focus on Michigan since that's my home and it's what I know best. Um, I debated between focusing on England and Michigan and decided that I don't know enough about England and it would be a little bit hubris of me to try to speak about England uh, forcefully. So I'm going to talk about Michigan and you can see if it applies to you or not. And I wanted to start a little bit by just talking about the differences because there are, there are many differences. And one thing to keep track of is, is that the Michigan, England is about 50,000 square miles. Michigan is about 58,000 square miles. So Michigan is a bit bigger. Um, it has, but England has 53 million people and Michigan only has about 9.9, .9, just under 10. So you all have about five and a half to six times um, the population and less land space than we do. And so that gives us some advantages. And I just want to give you an, a kind of context for Michigan for those of you who aren't exactly aware of where it is. Um, we're in the upper reaches of the Midwest. We border four of the Great Lakes. So about 18% of the world's fresh water surrounds Michigan. Um, and then if we drill in a little bit, the, first, the part that I'm really gonna speak about is a tri-county area um, that includes uh, Michigan State University, includes Lansing, the state capital, and includes our house um, and where we live. And I'm focusing on this, this tri-county area because the 83 counties of Michigan are divided up into 12 regional planning commissions. So these are government bodies that don't, there's no elected officials there, but they do get federal and state money with regards to transportation, with regards to some public housing stuff, with regard to some issues of food security and some other things. And so when we start thinking about planning in some kind of a regional context, it makes sense to me to think about what government entities are there you can start to plan around. And so we can kind of break it down into that. And to give you an idea, um, that little arrow you're going to see, if you look in the, the kind of the upper reaches of that, um, you see that the Tri-County area includes Lansing, it includes Michigan State University, um, the arrow points to where we live. So that's our house, my wife Lisa and I. Um, we bought that in 2003, and to give you an idea, that's 25 acres of land with a nice house, and, a, and there was a small dairy barn and a four-stall horse barn on it. The cost of that was less than the, than the average cost of a detached house in Oxford in 2003. So land prices are a bit less. Um, you can get a bit more for your money there. And what it also means is, is that we do have a lot of land relative to population. And that's an important consideration to keep track of. The other thing to keep track of here is that when we think about regional and local in our context, I know when, I go to the, when we go to Tesco or when we go to the farmer's market and there's an organic farmer that brings in so typically right now it was organic apples and some garlic and some things that can be stored and then organic food mostly from Spain. And of course Spain for you seems like a distant place but it's about half the distance that California is for us. Um, and so distance has also become a, a, a different type of thing to think about. And when I think about a resilient food system what I think about is a food system that has a range of different diversities. Uh, a lot of people that I work with in the NGO world in Michigan and when I was in New Jersey there um, and across the United States thinks that if everything were small farms and we could produce everything in small farms, be more sustainable, more resilient. 
I'm going to talk later about why I think that's not true, but my point here is that I think diversity of scale is absolutely important. We need small farms, we need big farms, we need medium scale farms to produce the tonnage of food that's needed for 500,000 people, 10 million people, 60 million people, or 7 billion. We need a diversity of systems. Again, many people, and I'll talk about organic versus conventional a little bit later, but many people argue that if it was, everything was organic, everything would be fine. And my feeling on this is, is that we still don't know what is, what is really sustainable. And of course, the, the main characteristic that many people apply to sustainability is that it's a process and not, a, not an endpoint, not a product. And so it's about continuous improvement. And the way that we're going to move to an ever more sustainable agriculture and food systems is to look at different types of systems. That doesn't mean there's not things right now about our current food system we can say we should really get rid of that. But it does mean that we're probably going to have a mixture as we move down the road. And then diversity of production strategy and product, predict, uh, diversity of production points. So right now, for example, I'll show you some images of California projections for climate down the road. But half the domestic produce um, that's, that's produced in the United States is grown in California, almost all in the Central Valley. And the rest is grown all over the United States. Um, something like 86% of the country's almonds are produced in California. Um, you know, so there's, there's these, we have these production centers for a whole bunch of historical reasons, both economic, both um, climatological and, and environmental, and technological development. But we probably need to diversify those, and that's one of the hallmarks of city region food systems. Diversity of backgrounds. Early on in the 20th century, there were Ten, hundreds of thousands more African-American farmers than there are today. The number of African-American farmers in the United States has dropped by about 96% um, since the early part of the 20th century. And so one of the things, especially when in a place like Detroit, Michigan, which now has 750,000 people and is 92% African-American, one of the hallmarks for them of food sovereignty is that the producers of their food look more like them. And so thinking about how do we move back to increase the, the diversity in our food system, both in production and in the supply chain, is, is critical. How do we minimize external inputs? And again, I'll talk about that in the context of city region food systems when we think about phosphorus and nitrogen. Um, and so we move on from there. So a lot of diversity is required and there's reasons for a lot of it. And so I would argue that's, that simultaneously, one of the things we need to do is to think about how do we re reduce GWP star? How do we use primarily green water um, for production and not blue water, i.e. water from um, surface waters and underground aquifers, but rain-fed agriculture? How do we recycle nitrogen and phosphorus um, in a way that doesn't make us have to use tremendous amounts of energy to produce nitrogen and, and tremendous amounts of energy to, it, to extract a non-renewable resource, namely phosphorus. How do we allow for increased biodiversity? How do we do some land sparing in addition to allowing our agricultural system to allow for more biodiversity at, uh, inside it? And how do we increase renewable energy use in the food system? We'll talk about that a little bit with respect to scale. And then on the other side, how do we increase, increase livelihood potential? Um, we can think about that in a place like Michigan where we have a number of small farmers, farmers of an acre, two acres, five acres, but fundamentally they're not making money. And there has to be, if it's a household, somebody in that household's working off the farm to balance the books and probably to generate the health care um, for the family. How do we alter dietary patterns towards more healthy and sustainable? We'll talk about that. And then we need a backstop to food insecurity with a reduced necessity for it. So we talk about the emergency feeding system in the United States, but it's really not an emergency feeding system, it's a chronic feeding system. And it's a way that food manufacturers, and in some cases farmers, can move what essentially doesn't sell on the shelves in the supermarkets or can't get to market into a way to get it to people who don't have enough food otherwise. So how do we make that more of an emergency system and not a chronic system? And I argue this will be increasingly difficult to do without city region food systems. So for me, the data indicate that the food system can become part of the solution for environmental challenges rather than part of the problem. And I'll talk about why I think that a bit too a little bit later. And the food system can be an instrument of human health, well-being, dignity, and livelihood rather than destroying those things. And again, we'll talk about that a bit. <clears throat> 
So I'm going to use the Tri-County area as a case study. Um, Ingham, Clinton, and Eaton County are the three counties out of the 83 in Michigan. They're right central in the state. Um, to, let's see, I guess it would be your left, is if you go over 85 miles from there, you hit Detroit. And if you go the other direction, you go through Grand Rapids and you hit Lake Michigan. Um, if you go south about 40 miles, you hit the border of Indiana. So it's pretty much right in the lower center part of the state. Now, why in Michigan, why in the Tri-County area should we care about this? Well, California, I mentioned, is the prime producer of vegetables. If we look at that, the three maps, what we see is increasing number, of course, darker is always bad when it comes to climate models and, and pictures. Um, and what we see is, is that that red section in the middle gets darker and darker and darker as we move up towards the end of the 21st century. That central kind of oval ellipse that goes down the middle of the state is the Central Valley, where about 90% of the produce and nuts that are grown in California are grown. The other part about that is the climate change predictions predict that about 75% of the snowpack in the Sierra Madres will disappear. They'll still get the same amount of precipitation, but it's going to come down as rain. What does that mean? That means that water runs off more quickly when it comes down instead of being stored in the mountains for running down in June, July, and August when they need that rain, that rain-fed irrigation for all those crops. And so what that means is without thousands of, literally thousands of dams to hold that water back in the Sierra Madres, they're going to lose all that water and they're going to lose irrigation potential. We can look at Michigan, and again, in all of these, darker is, is worse in many ways. Um, we see that projected change in average temperature goes up. Um, protected change in the number of nights below 32 degrees goes up. What this means in the northeast, northwestern part of our lower peninsula, where most of the tart cherries in the United States are grown, about 80% of the U.S. tart cherries are grown, is that there's going to be less um, ice on the Lake Michigan. Less ice on Lake Michigan means less of a moderating effect on temperatures in the land base right around there. It also means the potential for a late frost. And in 2002, there was a late frost in Michigan that killed 95% of the cherry crop up there. And it was after that, actually, that Michigan started losing its preeminence globally in tar, tar cherry production, and a lot more crops started getting grown in Eastern Europe. And then we see the number of change, change in the number of days over 90 degrees Fahrenheit, and the change in the number of days of heavy precipitation. Now, with all of that said, there was a funny little kind of cartoon video that I found on, from Popular Science, a wonderful peer-reviewed journal, um, that looked at, I was kidding about that, by the way, if you don't know it, um, that looked at kind of where's the place to be in the United States. And they kind of, on this map, they put in, okay, all the places where sea level is going to rise and it's going to flood out areas. All the places where tornadoes are, are slated to increase. All the places where hurricanes are slated to increase. All the places where there could be an increase in mosquito-borne infections because of, of increasing temperatures. And when they got done putting all those things on the map, what they found out was that Michigan and Wisconsin will probably be the two places to be by 2100 in the United States. So there you go. So I'm holding on to my land. <laughs> now the other thing that I think is, is that we need to think seriously, and of course I'm not the only one to say this, about biogeochemical cycles. We've typically had a source to sink mentality for the last hundred years or so, right? We, we make nitrogen from propane and from nitrogen gas in the air. We extract phosphorus from mines in Florida. We spread it and it goes, the products that come off of that land go to cities and people eat it and then people defecate and urinate and all that stuff goes to a treatment plant and it goes out into the waterways. In some cases now in cities, it, it gets treated and, and gets um, alkalinized and it gets, treated, it gets put on the land as sewage sludge. But for the most part, we take it, we put it onto land, we eat it, we consume it, we defecate, we urinate, and we get rid of it. And so what we've done is created a very energetically expensive um, process for, for, for building our crops. The other part of it is water stress. So many parts of the United States right now are water stressed. That area in the lower part of Lake Michigan um, is right around Chicago, in and around Chicago. Um, but you look at the Southwest, Arizona down there, um, where in the winter time, in January and February, 90% of the romaine lettuce produced in the United States comes from Arizona. 
And it's all fed on, it's all irrigated crops. And most of that irrigation is either flood furrow or overhead irrigation, the two most inefficient forms of irrigation there are. And the population demographics, because of all immigration and everything, there will probably be an explosion of population demographics there that's gonna need water anyway. So our ability to continue doing that in these water stressed areas is, is gonna be sorely challenged. And on the other hand, we've got this rise, increasing rise of obesity rates in the United States. Again, darker is worse. So you can look across the South and across the Midwest and across the Eastern seaboard in the lower part. And what you see is that obesity rates that go anywhere from 30% to somewhere above 50%. Um, and so dealing with that and all, and all of the non-communicable diseases that come along with that and that are associated and unassociated with obesity is part of the food system's challenge. Okay. So what will, or at least what might be? Well, I would argue that, for example, one of the things we're gonna see is increasing challenge of production centers. Example, chocolate in Cote d'Ivoire. Well, the Mars, I was talking to the research director at Mars Candy Company a few years ago at a conference, and they were working with climate scientists to identify points around the globe that might be good chocolate producing areas because they're gonna lose the current chocolate producing areas because of climate change. Bananas in Central America. Um, I'll show you in an, another slide, next slide, that the U.S. gets the vast, the majority of their bananas from Guatemala. Now, climate change indicates that in fact there might be um, an increase in the growing range of bananas in Guatemala. However, they're gonna be water stressed, there's gonna be an increasing population that needs water, and many, for many of those farmers, bananas is a secondary crop to something that probably they won't be able to grow as climate changes. So they may give up the bananas because they can't grow the other thing. And then almonds in California, which I mentioned earlier. Then we've got the challenge of shifting production center. So let's take chocolate, for example. We may find that there's a great place to, to produce chocolate somewhere else, but there's no cultural capital there to be able to do it. There's no knowledge system within the indigenous communities, within the people that live there, to grow those particular crops. We may be able to find the ecological and environmental characteristics, but we may not find the cultural characteristics. And I'll show in Michigan how, because of the diversity of agriculture that we have right now, we're actually in a very good position to think about diversifying our agriculture even more. And then there's a the challenge for what's next in the current production centers. For example, right now, I think everybody in here has probably heard about the Mexico-US border um, and the things that this person we call our president is trying to do. And what we find is, is that most of those refugees that are at the border are Guatemalan, and they mostly come from the cities in Guatemala but that's only their proximal location. A few years before that, before they came to the cities, they were farmers. And several years of drought drove them off the land and it drove them into the cities. And then the crime rates in the cities and the lack of work drove them out of the cities. So they arrive at the US-Mexico border. They're climate refugees. And the estimation is, is there could be as many as, as 20 million climate ref 5 million climate refugees over the next 20 years in Central America. So if we think about a place like, like Guatemala, where it's the 2018 the leading U.S. banana supplier with one, almost 2 billion metric tons, 45% of our total U.S. imports. Now the thing about all those imports to keep track of, there was a study a couple years ago that looked at the relationship of international trade to biodiversity. And what they showed on a global level was that about 30% of the decrease in biodiversity could be attributed to, to international trade. So one of the things I think we have to give thoughts about, and what you'll see when I talk about city region food systems specifically is, is I'm not arguing that every city region should produce 100% of its food supply and whatever you can grow there, good for you, and whatever you can't, you gotta give up. What I am saying is, is that we need to massively rethink the extent to which we engage in global trade, the extent to which we rely in production centers across the globe, um, whether it's Spain or whether it's California, or whether it's Guatemala for producing specific items, and how do we diversify those and bring biodiversity back in line with international trade playing the part that it can in restoring global biodiversity and not destroying it. So when we think about that, um, ways to reduce the environmental issues, how do we bring them back within the boundary limits? Well, the first thing, of course, is that we need to think about um, dietary pattern change. And of course, the thing we always hear about is we need to reduce meat consumption. We'll talk about that more when I talk about the Tri-County area specifically. 
But the other thing to keep, keep track of is all those excess calories that we consume. I did a calculation for a paper I wrote um, about six or eight, about a year ago now, and calculated that all the excess calories consumed in the United States, if you convert that to corn syrup sugar, to corn sugar and corn oil, it's about, um, what did I come up with? Two and a half million acres of corn just to produce the excess calorie, just to eat the excess calories that we do on a, on a yearly basis in the United States. So it's both, it's, every, it's all those things. And our production practices, there's no question that the way that we produce food has a big impact on the environment. We'll talk more about that in a, in a few minutes. Our supply chain practices, part of this is about waste. So part of the supply chain practice, when we think about things like fruits and vegetables, is quality standards when they go into the store. And so those quality standards means that a lot of stuff either sits in the field or it gets rejected at the point of delivery because it doesn't meet the quality standards for whatever reason. That's just one example. Then there's consumer handling practices. We're in the developed world here in the UK, EU, the United States. Something like 30 to 40% of our food is wasted and most of that is at the level of the consumer. We buy too much, we put it in the refrigerator, we forget about it, it gets moldy or it goes soft and we throw it out. At least here it goes into a recycling bin. Um, and gets picked up once a week. I don't know of any, there's probably a couple places in the United States that do that, but I don't know of, of there's none in Michigan that I know of. I've talked about production centers and, do, and diversifying those. I'm not gonna talk about that again here. And then we think about the reward structures. The example that you probably aren't familiar with is, is that in the United States, we have county fairs and state fairs in every agricultural county in the United States. So there's a county fair once a year and there's 4-H programs where the 4-H student, uh, high school students, whether it's goats or sheep or cows or pigs or vegetables or whatever it might be, they produce things and they take them to the fair and they get sorted and graded and everything like that. Well, and they do this with, with um, the adult farmers as well. And so for example, Michigan Milk Producers Association gives out an award every year for the top dairy producer. Well, the top dairy producer is determined by how many pounds of milk does the cow produce per year. So in Michigan now, the average is about 26,000 pounds in a conventional dairy milk per year. And that cow lasts about 2.6 parturitions. And then they're made into hamburger for McDonald's. And what if we, in fact, gave the reward based on something else? Like, oh, I don't know, something like pounds of pesticide used per pound of, of milk. That might be an interesting one to look at. I'll, I'll show you a bit about that in a minute. So the point of that is, is that the reward structures that we have in agriculture forced, are guaranteed to force a productionist st uh, strategy and not a strategy that takes anything else into account. And finally, there's future protein sources, which we can talk about a little bit. And then there's poly policy incentives for all of this. Much of this, there are policy disincentives. There's disincentives for transitioning to organic, for example, because you got a three year waiting period. And during that period, uh, first of all, you can't market it as organic. And secondly, your yields are probably down a fair bit. And so you get a double whammy on, on income. So there's a number of things we can do. And so what does this mean practically for production practices? Well, it means we minimize external inputs. Again, I'm not saying organic is the be all or end all, but what I am saying, there is a global study that came out a while back that looked at, could we feed the world globally with organic? And the answer was yes, but. And the but part is, is that the, the yes is we can if three other things happen simultaneously. Reduce meat consumption, reduce weight by at least 50%, reduce waste by at least 50%, and nitrogen would be a problem. So how do we do that? So the point is, is that we could massively increase organic production and other types of production that minimize inputs. We can think about creating circularity. Instead of that nitrogen and phosphorus being a source to sink, how do we make that a cyclical process? We can increase soil carbon. I'll, talk, I'll show you a couple slides in a minute of some data around intensive pasturing as a strategy for increasing soil carbon and organic practices for row crop production as a way to increase soil carbon. We can spare land and work with nature and allow for enhanced biodiversity. I've got a colleague at, at MSU, Doug Landis, in entomology, who's done a lot of work with the blueberry growers who are on the western side of the state for the most part. We grow a lot of blueberries. And what he's found is, is that if you have native habitat around the blueberries, 
In fact, you keep the native, uh, a higher degree of native pollinators around and they're more accessible to pollinate the blueberry crop when it comes into flower. And we minimize the use of blue water, which I talked about a little bit. We increase renewable energy use. And we'll talk about that a bit because I think that one of the things that's probably true, although this is where I kind of jump down a rabbit hole that's not my expertise, is that it's probably possible to think about using renewable energy at a smaller scale than it is at a scale of five or 10,000 acres. Um, there are, there's one company in the United States that's working with a hydrogen tractor, working at developing a hydrogen tractor that could be used on larger scale um, commercial farms for row crop production. The problem with that is, is my understanding from talking to people is hydrogen is only about 8% efficient in terms of, of, of transferring the energy of the sun into the energy of traction for, uh, with hydrogen. And we can eliminate topsoil erosion. There's interesting research from Iowa State University um, looking at on farms, taking about eight sites on farms, and saying, what would we have to do to eliminate the flow of sediment and phosphorus into the, the, the lakes and streams that go to the Mississippi Basin, that go into the Mississippi River, down to the Gulf of Mexico, and along with NYCHA, and create the dead zone every summer, the massive dead zone. And what they found on these farms is, is that if you took the right 10% of land out of production, you reduce the flow by 85% of sediment and phosphorus and nitrogen. So in fact, it's, it's, and that's the, just basically the most erodible soils. And you put that into permanent cover crops so that stuff, it also serves as a trapping resource. But at any rate, the point is, is that there is ways to eliminate topsoil erosion, but we again have to get away from the productivist mentality that says, as Earl Butts said at one point back when he was Secretary of Agriculture, um, plant hedgerow to hedgerow, and then take out the hedgerows and keep planting. So we need to think about these biogeochemical cycles, and of course, in the U.S., we have a massive problem with phosphorus, and we have a problem with nitrogen in terms of excess um, usage, excess losses, and excess levels of pollution because of it. There was a recent, I'll digress for a second, I can go down rabbit holes, and I try not to do it too much. But there was a, a case, a court case in Des Moines, Iowa, about a year ago that was decided. And in that case, the city of Des Moines and the Water Authority of Des Moines sued the farmers of Iowa for um, pollution of the, the fresh water that they were using. So they had to put in huge, extensive purification plant to take the, the chemicals, the, petro, the uh, agrochemicals and nitrogen and, phos the nitrogen and phosphorus out of the water supply. The reason for that is because when the, Fre when the Clean Water Act was passed in the United States, agriculture was exempted because it's not considered a point source pollution. However, most of those farms in Iowa are tiled, which means that the water, the water that comes down from rain is collected in these tiles and it eventually gets into one big pipe and comes out into a waterway. And so the city of Des Moines was claiming that that was in fact a point source. Well, they lost. So we'll see where that goes. But with phosphorus, one of the things to think about is that phosphorus is a non-renewable resource. It is a mined resource, and it is limited. Right now, for example, the United States is relatively self-sufficient. We produce about 97% of the phosphorus that we use on a, on a yearly basis across the board, most of which is used in agriculture. That supply, mostly from Florida, probably has about 20 or 30 years left. You all, all the farms here probably are getting their phosphorus from Morocco. Morocco and, and that area has the vast majority of the, of the phosphorus resources. But some estimates estimate that by about 2070, we'll hit peak phosphorus. Now, that's very diff difficult to decide because a lot of this information is proprietary and what they release is not necessarily accurate. But suffice it to say that if we keep using phosphorus like we are, at some point down the road, some generation beyond us is gonna find out, oops. And remember, phosphorus is absolutely essential for life. Most of you have probably had at least one biochem course and you know about ATP. And you know that the P is phosphorus and there's no life without phosphorus. So this is um, uh, work from Dana Cordell in, in Australia, who's probably one of the best people um, regarding phosphorus. And she talks about kind of how much phosphorus will we be using in a business as usual case, which you can see there is the top line. And then as we start doing some things with efficiency in agriculture, in the food chain, et cetera, and then how do we start to think about recycling it? Whether it's animal manure, human manure, 
Um, and what we get to is a usage rate for phosphate rock that's actually very low. If we get to that usage rate for phosphate rock, we extend the lifetime that we have for phosphorus by a large part, by a large number of, of decades and probably centuries. Okay. So phosphorus, and phosphorus is one of those things where we can precipitate it. Some treatment plants are now precipitating it into a, a compound called struvite, and that can be packaged and reused. But it's not being done broadly yet. And so there's a lot of phosphorus that, that in fact is being wasted. And, in, and the way that we currently raise animals in the United States, predominantly, um, which is finishing in large animal confinement facilities, there's nowhere for that, for that to go except as a pollutant. So when we start to think about nitrogen and phosphorus from city regions, the question becomes, well, how much can we actually get? We know phosphorus is non-renewable and essential for life, and we know that nitrogen is energetically costly. So let's think about human waste phosphorus. On average, there's about six tenths of a kilogram per person per year that comes out in the urine and the feces. About two thirds in, the, both for phosphorus and nitrogen, about two thirds in the urine, about one third in the feces. So there's about, in, in a place like the Lansing area, there's about, with 470,000 people, there's about 272 metric tons of phosphorus per year, or about 6.3 kilograms per acre, which on an average level means about 8% of the, of the amount that's conventionally used. And their estimates are we can probably reduce the amount that's conventionally used. If we think about nitrogen, there's about four and a half kilograms per person per year of, of nitrogen that's excreted. Again, two thirds urine, one third feces. That's about 2,100 metric tons of nitrogen per year. Um, and that's about 25.3 kilograms per acre, which would be about 16% of the conventional usage. And again, that's the current conventional usage. That's not necessarily the usage that we have to have if we have better crop rotations with legumes and other kinds of things. So why expand organic and why expand pasture? So let's talk about that a little bit. Well, as I said, as I mentioned before, if we look at pesticide usage, I, I, this data actually is not available online anymore. The federal government quit posting this data at some point in the past, so this is somewhat old data. But on average, in Michigan, you have about two pounds per acre of pesticides applied for soybeans and almost three pounds per acre for corn. Wheat, not so much. Um, pasture's about 0.078. So again, if we start thinking about um, raising ruminant animals on pasture and the relative production, say, per pound of, per the, for the amount of pesticides you have to apply versus feeding them corn and soybeans to raise them, it's vastly different. So one of the things to think about is, is that if we, if we dramatically want to reduce pesticide use without um, everything going organic, one way to do that is think about, so let's reduce the, the amount of acres of corn and soybeans that we produce. And by the way, pesticides take about 5.4 kilograms of CO, they produce about 5.4 kilograms of CO2 equivalent per every kilogram that's produced. So they're fairly energetic. Nitrogen um, fertilizer produces something like 6.5. Okay. Now, we've also become very locked in. So I'd like to preface this slide by saying that one of the truisms in research today, and I'm sure that all of you can identify with this, is unless you're in the social sciences and your research doesn't cost much, you only get, you only can, you only get answers to the questions you ask, and you can only ask the questions you can get funded to ask. And so what questions you can get funded is a, real, is a real issue. And so, for example, in the United States, if you're doing research on, on optimizing corn and soybean production, or you're, you're doing research on opti optimizing milk production in a cow that's fed corn and soybean in a very highly specialized diet, funding is still tight, but there's, there's hundreds of millions of dollars there if you take a combination of government and industry. If you want to look at, at how, do I, how do I optimize the um, environmental attributes and the production of cows on pasture, well, that's another story. It's very hard to get funding. So some people say, well, you know, you, you, can't, you can't get enough production in, in this system to make it work. And my answer to that is, is that if we were doing, if we had done the same amount of parallel research in pasture-based systems versus confinement feeding systems, and we had spent about the same amount of money optimizing both systems, I'd really be interested to see what that data looked like. Even without that, and this is Jason Roundtree, who's a colleague of mine in animal sciences, um, and his grad student, Paige Stanley, 
did a study where they, they looked at soil carbon over a four-year period in an intensively managed beef um, pasture system. Um, they've got a 40-acre site at one of our outlying research stations. And you know, many of the, the carbon fluxes in ruminant systems, they tend to look at what's released. They don't look at what's captured. And so it's really gross release, it's not net release. Now, so if we do a gross release and we look at soil carbon flux, what we see is, is that without soil carbon flux, what we see is, is that the production of um, methane CO2, CO2 equivalents in a feedlot system is less than it is in a pasture-based system. If we add in soil carbon flux, accounting for the what's soil carbon flux in the corn production, soybean production, et cetera, it's basically the same. If we do the same experiment in these, in these intensively managed rotational grazing systems, what we find that is in fact, like I said, the um, CO2 equivalent flux is higher in the pasture system. But if we now take into account soil carbon flux, in fact, there's a, there's a fairly large net carbon sequestration in that system. And so now then other people have said, well, but this doesn't last for long. The reality is we don't know the answer to that, how long it would last in these intensively managed systems because we don't have that long term of a data. But let's say that it could potentially last for 20 years. That's what some people have argued that it could be. Well, the other piece of that is, is that there's a sampling error there as you go down the road for decades. Because for soil carbon sampling, you're typically doing a 30 centimeter depth. But as you build soil carbon, you build the depth of topsoil. As you build the depth of topsoil, you've forgotten part of the, first cent part of the, uh, the end of the first 30 centimeters you were, you were measuring. You're measuring a new 30 centimeters. So in fact, we don't know, and there's no reason to believe, based on kind of millennium of topsoil development in the Great Plains area, where some of those soils in Iowa were 18 feet thick when, when they started plowing them. Now they're barely there. Um, there's no reason to believe that you can't get long-term soil carbon sequestration in these systems. That doesn't mean we shouldn't eat less meat. It does mean there's a way possibly to have some ruminant meat in the diet and have it be beneficial for the environment in the long term. And there's the possibility of virtual fencing with RFD tags on the animals so you don't have to go out there and change gates all the time and move cows from different parts of the pasture all the time. You can do it electronically. Those are still kind of in development, mostly out of Australia. And then we've got soil carbon buildup in an organic system. This is a cropping system at the Rodale uh, Farming Systems Trial in Kutztown, Pennsylvania. From 85 to 95, the system still goes. But over that 15 years, they monitored soil carbon change. And what they found right here is, is that in both the manure-based um, nutrient addition system and the legume-based rotational system, there was a net in a, a significant increase in soil carbon, whereas in the conventional, there was not. So even with some corn and soybean production, there's ways to think about how can we make that more beneficial rather than less. So now let's take a little bit of Michigan agricultural bit of context. So there's about 47,000 farms in Michigan. This data came out about a month ago, so I've been madly trying to calculate it since then. The latest uh, census of ag just came out. There's about 9.7 million acres of, of farms. I apologize for this not being in hectares, it's in acres. The tri-county area that I'm talking about, we've got about 2,900 farms and about 618,000 acres of farms. If you look at the farm size there, there's a great diversity of size. We've got a number of farms that are above 1,000 acres. Around us, there's a, um, the Osterleys are about five or 6,000 acres of land that on two sides of us is part of their land. Um, on one side of us, we've got Monsanto, and on one side, we've got MSU. So we're surrounded by farms. Um, and only about 76,000 of those are certified organic right now. We think about field crops. We've got about 2 million acres of corn, 2.5 million acres of corn, a half million acres of wheat, 2.5 million acres of soybeans. There's a pretty good, most farms do a pretty good job of a corn soybean rotation and or a corn wheat soybean rotation. Except when corn went up to $7 a bushel. Then suddenly there was two years of corn before they went to the next crop. And in some cases three. But now. Corn prices are down, so they're back to a rotation. Now, if we think about fruits and vegetables, we've got a, we've got a huge diversity in Michigan of production. Um, our orchard acres and our berry acres across the state is about 125,000 acres, only about 300 in the Tri-County area, however. And what you see is that the big three are apples, tart cherries, and blueberries. 
Um, interestingly enough, the apples, until about 2002, 2003, the apples almost all went to juice and sauce. And then Chinese concentrate, Chinese concentrate started coming into the U.S. market, and the market for their apples collapsed almost all, overnight. So they had to figure out how to go to a fresh market apple. The problem with apples, there's two things you got to deal with for fresh market apples in that situation. You've got to have different varieties. It's not the same varieties that you use for sauce and juice. And you've got to have controlled atmosphere storage so that you can extend their shelf life into about March or so, March or April. Um, it, they've done that now. About, now about 30% of the, of the crop is fresh market in the state. Tart cherries, I mentioned before. Blueberries, we grow a lot in the sandy soils on the west side of the state. And then we've got vegetables. Again, we've got a lot of vegetable acreages. We've got a lot of asparagus, an interesting story there, because again, around 2000, until about 2003, almost every acre of asparagus went to canned asparagus. Who eats canned asparagus? And it, I mean, the, the consumption was about a half a pound a year and going down. And they were getting a nickel a pound from the processor. They were losing money on every pound because they had a, the processors had a cap, captive market. Well, they realized that they could start selling it fresh because now that, that was kind of when the Buy Michigan was starting to take hold buy local kind of thing. And they used the same varieties and the harvest was almost the same. There was very little changeover for, for them to go to fresh. I just, just looked in the other day and they got, last year they got about 90 cents a pound for fresh market asparagus. Cucumbers, we got 34,000 acres of cucumbers. 95% of those go to dill for, for pickles. Um, and then we've got 50,000 acres of potatoes, almost all of which go to Frito-Lay for potato chips. So what does this mean, the good and the not so good? Well, the first part of it is we grow a wide and raise a wide variety of things. So there's a lot of skills among farmers. And at our land grant university, Michigan State, we've had to maintain a large research base around a wide variety of things to satisfy the needs of all those different farmers. Um, we've got good climatic conditions for a wide range of crops. And for some crops, we're probably gonna go into better climatic conditions than we do now, especially for some nuts. We've got a greater diversity in marketing strategies than we did 20 years ago. There's much more direct marketing than there, there was then. There's much more fresh market um, farming for like apples and asparagus. And there's also much less antagonism by the traditional ag commodity groups towards organic and alternative marketing and alternative production than there was um, in say 2000. Small acreage farmers are numerous, but they're not necessarily productive, um, profitable, and they're not producing tonnage. And there's a challenge to that tonnage that's needed. So I always, I always like to say to people, when they say we can do everything like this or like this, I'm gonna say, okay, how do you get to the tonnage? In Lansing, with 470,000 people, right now we need about 200 million pounds of vegetables and 131 million pounds of fruit a year. That's based on current consumption. If people ate the way the, the dietary guidelines suggest they do, we'd need 300 million and 200 million, a half a, mil, half a billion pounds of produce. I've never come up with a way on how to get that from one acre farms. That doesn't mean they're not important. So consuming more. All right, there's a challenge to doing it small. So just give you an idea. If everything were eighth of a, uh, eight tenths of a hectare, an acre of, of production of fruits and vegetables, we currently have 194,000 farms across the country that produce fruits and or vegetables. If, we, if everything was from one acre, we'd need 5.6 million. And by 2050, we need 7 million. If everything was 10 times that on 10 acres, we'd still need more than a half a million. So we need to increase by 300,000, 350,000 farms. Um, if, and if people were consuming the way they should, we'd have to increase by that many. So my point in this is, is that we can't do everything small. We've gotta have small, medium, and large, and we've gotta have a strategy where farmers can move from small to medium scale and into large scale if they want to. And in the United States, USDA defines scale by dollar by sales. And a, and a large scale farm for fruits, and veg, fruits or vegetables would, would be selling over $500,000 a year, which sounds like a lot, but in the scheme of things, it's actually not, okay? What's next? Okay, so what does this mean for farmers? It means we need, to, we need a variety of needs for training, land, and financing. There are actually a lot of young people in Michigan and across the United States that would like to go into farming. Now, many of them have no idea what that means. And so luckily, a lot, of, a lot of universities and a lot of the land grants have student farms now where students can work for a summer out there or two summers. 
And many of them get the idea, you know, this is hot, hard work and maybe not what I want to do. Um, others get the idea that this is what I want to do. Many of them come from, they come at it from an environmental background. They're interested in saving the environment and sustainability and all that. Um, and they learn that that's in fact hard, but they're interested. But they don't come from a farming background. They're suburban or urban backgrounds. They need a lot of time to develop skills. And they need land because they often don't have land in their hip pocket. They can't get it from mom and dad. And they need financing, which is often hard. They need to weigh a scale up without significant increases in labor. I think we need much greater impact, input on mechanization, including robots, for small and medium scale farms that is scale appropriate and cost appropriate for that scale. The biggest problem that organic farmers face when they're doing produce is weeds. And weeding by hand is not fun. And weeding mechanically is not necessarily easy, not necessarily all the equipment's there. But nice ro robots could do that. And we need electric based implements. Now I did some, some calculations to think about home economics on the farm. What would it mean for a farm in, in our Tri-County area to be able to support the, the household without having to have off-farm jobs and have decent health care. Well, the median income for a Michigan family is about 69,000 US dollars. I calculated how much, of, how much would have to be set aside on an annual basis so that 40 years from now when they're 65 they can retire and their retirement plan pulling out 4% a year, which is what everybody says to do to make it sustainable into the future, that they would, they would then have 70% of their income, which is what's estimated you need in retirement. To do that, they'd have to put about $21,000 a year into that plan. Remember, we don't have federal pension plans for everybody, for people. And we don't have federal national health care to speak of right now. And so at MSU, they, put, they pay about $16,000 a year for my, me and my family to have health care. So if I add those all up, you got to look at, a, at, an op, at an income for that, for that farm of about $107,000. That's after expenses. So that's what we need to work towards for families to actually be viable um, farming. And so if we think about the land balance then in the Tri-County area, oops, we've got about... Um, 495,000 acres of production currently. Well, if, we, if I look at, and we've got, if I look at the conventional column, and I say, given the population of 470,000 people, and given what is recommended for us to consume in grains and fruits and vegetables and protein and dairy, how many acres does it take to produce those for that 470,000 people? And those are the numbers I came up with. The total is about 324,000 acres out of that 495. If it were all done organically, and I used a, a notion of 80% yield relative to conventional, there's some data that indicates that's pretty good, but there's some other data that indicates that after about 10 years, the yields may actually not be different between the two. That over time, the yield difference tends to collapse. But we'll go with 80%. Then it needs about 405,000. If we took all of that protein, I, and I, I calculated all as meat for this, at this point, and dairy and put it into pasture production, it would be about 440,000 acres. So you can see we use basically the bulk of that um, for the production of the local food supply. And again, this is accounting for if all, the food, if all the food system was localized. And I'm not arguing that should be the case, but this gives an idea of what are the boundary conditions of acreage. And then I say, well, what if we reduce the meat? And so what if we reduce the meat to 20% meat and 80% dry beans? If we do that, we reduce the percentage of total acreage used from 65% to 30%. If we do it with 20% um, meat and 80% seeds, I did sunflowers, it's about 30%. If we mix beans and sunflowers, it's about 30%, 31%. So in any case, the point of that is, if we reduce meat from our current consumption patterns to 20% of that, which still allows us to have meat basically as a garnish every, every dinner if you want to, um, or have it go crazy one or two, two nights a week, we can use half, we go from 60% of the farmland to 30%. This assumes no food waste beyond typical processing. In fruits and vegetables, for example, I've accounted for the processing waste, like when you core an apple and the core gets tossed away, um, et cetera. 
So what could be done with those 300,000 acres that we could save, that we would have left over? Well, we could use it for biodiversity enhancement. We could use it for non-food products like plastics and fuels and fiber. We could use it for erosion elimination. We could use it for forest products. We could use it for emergency preparedness in cooperation with other city regions and have some, some things on hand for when things go wrong. And we could export to other regions, regions nationally and globally. Obviously, there could be a combination of these things. The point of that is, is that in that city region, first of all, now we've got recycling of nitrogen and phosphorus. We've got a reduced amount of meat consumption. We've got acreages that can be used for many different things beyond what they're being used for now. And we've still got, a, and we've got a healthy food supply. Now in Michigan, of course, we're seasonally challenged. There's when we can harvest tomatoes. The green is when we can do it outside. The stipple is when we can do it in unheated high tunnels. So you get about an extra month and a half on each end. If you take something like uh, spinach, we can basically get it all year. If you take something like apples, we can get them for a good part of the year, fresh out of, off the tree, and then stored in controlled atmosphere storage. And the season when we're not getting apples, other things come in like cane fruits. And so, so the point of this is, is that we, of course, have a fairly short growing season, and it does get cold. We had four days in January when luckily we were here, when it was minus 45 centigrade in Michigan. And they closed our public school for four days and they closed the university for three days, which is the first time they've ever closed it for more than one day at a time since 1855. It was cold. Um, but unheated hoop houses provide a great opportunity. These are structures that some of you may be familiar with. They look like a greenhouse, but there's no fossil fuel energy going into those. All the heat captures from the sun and there's no, no auxiliary light. Next step we can move to is greenhouses. After that, we can move to no sun systems. Please don't get me started on those. Um, we did a, a LCA on hoop house production of lettuce in January versus getting it from California. Rachel Plowecki, who was an undergraduate um, presidential fellow working with me, did this research. And what we found was the, um, the, the, the CO2 equivalence, yeah, CO2 equivalence for hoop, hoop house production was about 0.2, relatively speaking. Getting it from California was about one. Notice all because of transportation. The production was about the same, but refrigerated truck transportation is costly. If we add heat into it, it skyrockets. If we move to an indoor system, it really skyrockets. Tomatoes are similar. If we do it in, if we do it in California, it's about 0.6. If we do it in a hoop house, for those extra two months we get, two and a half to three months we get, it's about half that. We add in heat, it jumps. We add in electricity, it really jumps because you've got to put all that electricity to grow all the vegetative matter before you get to the fruit. Well, you're still using elect. Uh, no, not, no, not if we can tell you what, ask me that question afterwards. Okay. Okay. Now, when we talk about opportunities and livelihoods, we did this study in 2008 when Michigan was really in the doldrums economically and was, was the government was just hemorrhaging money and was in debt. And we looked at, how could Michigan, the Michigan food system be part of the solution? So we just modeled what if people ate, um, went from current fruit and vegetable consumption to public health recommendations, and what if when those things were available fresh in Michigan, people got them from Michigan? So not all year and all that kind of stuff. What we found then was that across the state for 10 million people, we need about 37,000 more acres of production, and it would, it would put $211 million of net income into farmers' hands. That's after taking into account the corn and soybeans that are taken out of production to put to, for those 37 acres, 37,000 acres. And there's 1,800 more off-farm jobs because of the spillover effects, okay? So I'm gonna finish here because I've gotten the high sign, but what's not been considered today, probably more than has been considered. Um, I started out with 100 PowerPoint slides and kept knocking it down and knocking it down. So we can talk for seven hours if you wish. Um, supply chains, although there's potential for electric vehicles, are greater for short haul, I think. Um, and there are coming online now some short haul electric vehicles, and so that's going to be an interesting one to follow. Processing, we haven't, I haven't talked about at all. Preservation, one driver of household energy use is increased number and size of refrigerators and freezers. And there's many others. So with that, I'm going to close, and we can have a lot of questions. I just want to finish with this slide. This is my grandma, Lucy. And the slide with her with the hat on, with the, the 
the top one on the corner is her and I when she was uh, uh, 94. And that was in the first microbrewery in St. Louis, which is where I was raised and where she lived. Um, and she loved it after she had the first one. Lisa and I took her there. She said, can I have another one? And we said, Grandma, we're not letting you drive anyway, so sure. Um, the bottom one is when she was 104. And then the other one with the little hat on is when she was 110. That was her 110th birthday. She died last August. Um, or she died, when did she die? Yeah, last August um, at 110. And she lived a full life. And I think she probably lived as sustainable a life as anyone could. When she died, she was living in one room and we cleared it out in 20 minutes. So she lived a good life, Lucy, okay? So we'll end with that and we can talk questions if you want. Thanks, Mike, for a uh, really fascinating talk. Uh, questions now, just to remind you that we are being uh, broadcast, so remember that when you ask a question. Uh, and let me, were you the gentleman who asked the question? So let me go first. Please tell me questions so I can uh, uh, line up a couple. Oh. Yes, thank you for a very interesting uh, presentation. So the I have two questions. One question, you had a slide with uh, usage of pesticides. Mm -hmm. Was that mainly Roundup or was that a mixture? It's a mixture. That's the total of all pesticides, just so you know. Okay, because in, in, in terms of soy, for instance, as far as I know, Roundup is, is the main pesticide. But anyway, the, the second question is concerning indoor farming mm -hmm. um, using disfunct skyscrapers and things like that mm -hmm. which has a huge advantage of um, cutting out transportation and transaction losses so i'd love you to tell us a bit more about that and and your thoughts about that okay do you want to take a few questions um yeah do you want to answer those and then I'll line yeah. Up yeah so I'd be quite honest with you, and with respect to the pesticide, I did that, on that Excel spreadsheet so long ago, I can't remember the exact list, but I know it was not just one thing for any of them, but I can't tell you kind of how much of each was it. So um, I just know that's the kind of total number. Now with respect to um, indoor and vertical farming, very interesting question, because I know that you know, Despommier at Columbia University published the, the book on vertical farming and, and started talking about kind of building skyscrapers to produce wheat and to produce corn and everything else. And so I'll just go on record as saying, I think that's the silliest idea I've ever heard. And I'll tell you why. Um, we can use, re and, and when, you, when I talk with, with people who are, are building vertical farm businesses in the United States, and I've been on a panel with a couple of them and chatted with them, um, their argument is, is that when you bring up the issue of energy, they say, well, you know, at some point we'll have enough renewable energy to do that. Okay, but I look at, you know, this computer we're using and our phones and these lights that are on, and the thing I say to myself is, that should really be our first priority for renewable energy. Now, if you talk, if you, if you talk to, maybe you're, are you in the renewable energy field? So am I gonna say somebody who's gonna get me in big trouble? Probably. So, um, okay, so I'll get myself in trouble. Um, I think it's going to be a long time before we get to sufficient renewable energy to do all the things we have to do with electricity, and then to do the things that we need to do with electricity, like um, transportation. And my, arg my basic argument is, why take something free away and add something that's not free? So indoor vertical farming, we eliminate the sun, and then we substitute renewable energy, let's say, for it. Okay? Now, I'm not as convinced about the transportation issue as, as you're making it out. That's another argument, I think, for city region food systems is we do have land in outlying areas, and they're not that far from the cities. New York's a whole different issue. I don't know how we feed New York. <laughs> I've got friends here from New York. Um, but in a place like Lansing, when I take that three-county area, Lansing is kind of the population center of that, that tri-county area. There's no place that's, about, that's more than about 20 miles, maybe 25 miles from Lansing. Okay? Now I realize 
That's gonna take energy to transport, but you've got the sun. There's no reason to eliminate it. We can do, now the thing that we can do, I think, is we can do much more with greenhouses out on the landscape and produce more year round. And there's gonna be some energy input, but most of the input over the course of the year is gonna come from the sun. Certainly in the winter months, if you wanna grow, grow tomatoes in the winter months, you're gonna do what the Dutch do. You're gonna have a greenhouse system, you're gonna use supplemented heat, and you're gonna use supplemental electricity with LED lights. And you're gonna do that. And we can think of ways probably on farm to produce energy to do that kind of thing in a reasonable way. And, and an interesting thing to think about is how would, we, how would we couple pasture-based ruminant production with energy production for greenhouses on farms? There's interesting research at Oregon State where they found that the grasses under the solar panels that had put, been put out in some fields had a better grass mixture for the ruminants than, than what was in the, in the sun areas because of the shade and the coolness and the water holding capacity of the soil under the lack of evapotranspiration. So there's actually some research going on in the States now about co-mingling solar energy production and, and beef production, for example. I'll let it go at that. Thanks, we can talk more if, if, with wine. I'm gonna take two questions here and here. So thank you, um, to Ray Taylor from Wolfed. Uh, you um, mentioned about emergency scenarios mm -hmm. and Professor Molly Chan, who you may know who has been a, a, a Martin School Fellow mm. and now works at uh, UNDRR, well, has done this okay. assessment report for the UN, okay. uh, looking at potential multiple breadbasket failure. Uh, multiple Mo breadbasket failure. Oh, okay, okay. Is that the kind of thing you, you were thinking about? And I'm afraid I do want to get you on to the other thing you mentioned, because there's, there are even worse scenarios, like a five-year volcanic winter, where you indeed might want a no-sun system. So are any of them despite what you said about renewable energy, or any of them in any way viable. Okay. Okay, could you pass the microphone? Go ahead. Thank you. Um, you seem to have described uh, the industrialization of farming, um, and it's now based on sort of business-like approach of inputs and outputs, mm -hmm. um, you know, efficiency gains, commoditization of food, and the consequential substitutability of the farmer's um, uh, output. Um, and, you know, there's a lack of variety as well. So in my mind, uh, I used to live in America for a bit. Value for money always meant more of something or cheaper. So to what extent do you think value for money could be better quality, more nutritious food? So in my head, I would imagine Italians would have, you know, uh, if you go to, if you want to spend some money, it would be on a better product, not more. So since you've taken a system approach to think about um, obesity as well, mm -hmm. to what extent could we actually have a, a, a better approach where we need to eat less but better quality, more nutritious, and then you can say homegrown uh, is better than imported. Okay. All right, good. Should I deal with those? Uh, if you could uh, deal with those, please. Okay. Okay. So first about emergency food and, and multiple dysfunctions, multiple collapses in the, in the bread basket and stuff. So one of the things I've been thinking about lately, and it's just kind of struck me, so in, and I know it's here too because I had one approach me, I wanted to talk, wanted to talk about Jesus, but the Mormon church um, in the United States has a system of, soup, of food pantries for their members, right? And they have a label called Desiree. And they have a number of processing centers around the country. They used to have 52. I think they've closed some of them. And in those processing centers, anybody in the Mormon church can come in. And so people come in with like bushel baskets full of tomatoes and things, and they spend the night canning tomatoes. But each of those, those um, canneries is responsible for canning two or three maybe products that get distributed across their food pantries around the country. And so across that, they get the spread of products that they need for the pantries, you know, various fruits and vegetables and grains, and they, they can wheat and do all kinds of things to preserve it. And so one of the things to think about is, is in a, in a system like this, let's just take the United States as an example, where you've got all these city regions, um, ones that have excess land could think about producing stuff that would be stored and would be available to various parts of the country in times of emergency. Now, the other piece of it is what about multiple basket failures? I would argue that that one of the things about diversifying production centers is that you reduce the, the, the chance that there's going to be massive failure across the whole landscape. 
And so that's another reason, I think, for having some excess production, because you're never going to be exact, right? But you have some excess production, probably some of that 300,000 acres, in my case, goes into this excess for in case that happens. And then if it doesn't happen, you store it for future use when you can. Okay, that was the first thing. The second thing was, was about vertical farms, right? And, and, no sun systems, right. Um, yeah, I, I have to tell you, I mean, so I, I think part of my antithesis to them is, is that in the US, what I'm seeing is the vast bulk of the, of the venture capital money that's going into agriculture, that's coming out of, say, the tech world in Silicon Valley and everything, is going into these no, no sun systems. Just a rough addition in my head, there's probably something like 200 to $250 million around the country that's going into various companies, either that are directly no sun system producers, um, or they're the software companies for that, or they're the, the robotic companies for that, or whatever it is. Okay, so there's a lot of money going into that. And there's, there's only one place that I know of where there's one university that has a billionaire funder that's funding some work that's doing intensive work around um, robotics for small farmers and different kinds of things like that. So part of it is, is just this, this um, dis, dis, uh, imbalance in where venture capital money is going. But the other piece of it is I really do think that it also distorts our perception of what we could be doing with agricultural farm, with farmland, um, into a way that we could, you can increase the amount of production per acre in hoop houses and greenhouses because you produce over a longer period of time. You get more, more yields per year, let's say. Um, and you can still use much less water than you would in, say, overhead sprinkler systems because most of that is trickle irrigated. Or in a greenhouse system, you can still do it hydroponically. And so I just have, I, I have a fear of that being our first choice instead of it being our last choice, okay? Now, when it comes to um, changing the way, kind of the way that, what, I think what you're asking me is changing the way that basically consumers perceive food and then that leading to kind of downstream effects. Is that correct? Yeah. Or upstream effects? Right. Right, you, right. You wouldn't, you know, shorter supply chains, and actually people would appreciate that and be healthy at the same time. Well, I mean, I, I think to some extent that there's an element of that that's happening. So I'll, I'll give you an example in Michigan. So, and I'm going to preface this by saying this has, no, this has nothing to do with me going there. It just is where I date time from. In 2003, when I got to Michigan State, I was at Rutgers for 20 years. When I got there, there were about 90 farmers markets in Michigan. Now there's about 350. In 2003, there were three farmers markets that could take our food stamp coupons, you know, the supplemental nutrition program for, for low income people, um, because they had the technology and there were three big ones in the state, one in Detroit, one in Grand Rapids, and one other one that I'm forgetting which one it is. Today, there's about 150 that can because of a partnership between the state and some nonprofits to get that technology into the hands of, of market managers and the emergence of a Michigan Farmers Market Association. So, and the, the amount of sales at those farmers markets has continued to climb. Um, and of course, it's mostly fruits and vegetables. There's very little meat sold. There's some sold, but relatively little. And there's relatively little dairy products, although we're starting to see more artisanal cheese in, the, in Michigan. So I think that to that extent, that's happening. I think the other piece of it is, is that um, in our, in our, in our schools, our K through 12 schools, for example, um, our center, one of our staff, Colleen Matz, runs a large program across the state for institutional purchasing. And when we started that back in about 2004, and we did a statewide survey of our school districts, there's 283 school districts in the state, 10% of them reported buying something from a local farmer in the last year. Now about 50% of the school districts in the state buy Michigan produce over the course of the year. Um, the hospitals is the same thing as happening with some of the hospitals. The universities now, like our university buys about $70,000 a year of produce from our student organic farm and they're buying stuff from others as well. University of Michigan is doing a similar thing with farms in their area. So I think there's an element of that that is happening. 
The other side of the coin, though, is, is that I think as long as we're used to, when I go into the store here, when it's Tesco's or Sainsbury and buy milk, um, I'm appalled at, at how cheap it is. Um, it's just, I know that the dairy farmers here are struggling mightily because the milk prices are so low. And so there's an element of it where you're similar to us in some ways in that people in general want low cost food. We wanna pay a low percentage of our income for food. And so, you know, my argument is, is that that said, there's a large swath of society that has the ability to pay more. And so they should look for opportunities to support people that are doing that. And then the trick is, is in the United States with, with SNAP benefits, with our food stamp program, food stamps are only designed to, su to support 60% of the food budget, not 100%, 60%. And so how in the United States do we develop, a, do we develop the program where those food stamps are more broadly available and there's greater encouragement for using those for healthy food and so that people don't have to go to McDonald's because it's the cheapest source of protein and it's the cheapest source of calories. Okay. Thank you. I think we probably just have time for a last question. Um, do you think the agricultural reforms in the US, such as the alteration of the reward structures that you mentioned, are feasible in the current political climate? And if not, how do you believe as a country the necessary changes to the food system can be made? So, easy <laughs> so this is what we'll conclude on, okay? <laughs> um, well, I'll start with a, with a small story, and I think Charles knows this story. In 2015, um, the U.S. Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee submitted a 600-page report to the Secretaries of Agriculture and Health and Human Services. And they had, to report, they had to send it to Congress, okay? In that 600-page report was 20 pages on how to encourage sustainability in the food system. I was a consultant to that committee and helped write that 20 pages. Congress immediately went to the secretaries and said, you shall not talk about that again, and shut it down. And so the bottom line is, at this moment in time, I don't think there's a lot of chance of doing that. And the bottom line reason is, I know this is being recorded, the bottom line reason of this is because the large agricultural commodity groups in our country are very, very powerful. And they have the pockets, they have the hands, they have the eyes and ears of a lot of legislators, okay? Now, um, the reality is, is that I think that is gonna change. So here's my optimistic side. Now, there's many parts of the Green New Deal that have been released that I think, well, first of all, I think it was released without nearly enough information in it. But that said, I think there's a lot of things that could be done inside a Green New Deal that encourages support for a lot of the things that I've talked about today. I think I'm working on a paper with a colleague back in the States, because I just haven't heard from her lately. Um, and at the end of that paper, I've written, I've suggested about 14 policy ideas that would be useful for encouraging this kind of a thing. And so I think there's a chance to do it. And I think, quite frankly, the way that it has to be framed is a both and, not as an either or. It's gonna be, a, uh, it's gonna be an evolutionary process to get to the point where this is the food system. And the trick is, if you, just, if you immediately go for, let's get rid of big ag, because first of all, my, there's a version of big ag that I think needs to be there to some extent to feed 7 billion, 300 mil, 350 million people in the United States. But that said, there's also a way to pull back their power. And so I think that some of that is a way to do that. There are some programs at USDA that are helping a lot in that direction, but they're very small. You know, remember, the USDA budget is 70% the food stamp program. It's about 20% all the supports for, for commodity farmers. And everything else that's in there is that last 10, 10 to 12%. And so there's like about a $30 million beginning farmer and rancher program that provides grants around the country for people working to help develop next generation farmers. It's very useful, but it's very small. Okay, so I'll leave it at that. Excellent. Um, let me invite everyone to come and join us for a drink afterwards. Um, I should say that Mike is part of the Oxford uh, Martin Visiting Programme, and that exists due to the generosity of Lillian Martin, and we're hugely grateful for her, and also to Mike for being such a, a superb uh, visitor here. Um, the next talk at the Oxford Martin School is on Thursday. Penny Mealy is part of our evolving economic, uh, economics talk. And um, Mike, I, I don't know, is it good genes or a taste for bear, 
beer. That's responsible for the longevity <laughs> of the uh, of the ham uh, well, family. I, I'll leave you to answer that over coffee. Please join me. I in do have an answer for that. <laughs> Please join me in thanking Mike for a really fascinating. Thing. <laughs>